I am going to keep the introductions short because I know that when you got the invitation, you were wondering, who is Tamara Radofsky? And so you looked her up, as we all do, you know, to know who, who are these speakers. But just briefly, Tamar is a, a philosophy professor here at Ohio State. Her degrees are from Brandeis University. Her focus and areas of expertise are in the ancient and medieval philosophy, Jewish and Islamic philosophy, phenomenology, and existentialism. Um, <clears throat> from her article that you perhaps read that she sent us all, um, you will see that she, that she sent us chapter one of her book, her out, upcoming book with Oxford Press, entitled Jewish Philosophy in the Middle, Age, in Middle Ages, Science, Rationalism, and Religion. And, and so we have chapter one of that in your mailbox if you haven't seen it yet. And uh, um, so she said, since, since Ian is the visitor uh, and the guest from far away, we should let him go first. So she's going second, and Ian will go first. So who is Ian Hutchison? Well, again, if you looked him up, you know that he's a professor of nuclear science and engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His uh, education is at Cambridge, as well as the National, uh, Australian National University in Canberra, who we were talking about because I've been there to Canberra. Um, and we welcome him back to Ohio tonight. He was here for a Veritas Forum a few years back. And so, can't, so um, Ian will kick us off, and then right after Ian uh, remarks, then Tamar will come up and share some remarks. Then um, we'll continue to eat and have our table discussions. And that's really the focus of tonight. Think of having one discussion, listening to the people and continuing to interact and ask questions. That's what we're going to do uh, after they finish. And then we'll do a Q&A up here. And then we'll all go downstairs and have some more drinks. Uh, so let's start with Ian. You welcome him with me. Thank you very much, Ian Hutchison. I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to try putting this into uh, its socket, so to speak, yep. and maybe then it won't fade in and out, but maybe it will, in which case I'll just have to use the force of my voice, and I hope that will be sufficient. Um, my intention is just to kick things off with some very quick, uh, brief remarks about the relationship uh, in knowledge between science and perhaps religious knowledge. And uh, that's my intention. And I'm going to keep to my 10 minutes allotment as closely as I can. So I'm going to read what I want to say. What I mean by science is natural science, the sorts of things that are discovered by physics, chemistry, biology, geology, and so on. That might seem obvious, but I want to avoid the confusion that arises because the unqualified word science now means something different from the Latin word scientia from which it is derived. Today, when questions of religion and science come up, natural science is the main topic. And I mean natural science by science. There are certain characteristics and strategies which science adopts for obtaining its knowledge. Um, they are the basis of its success. And I identify those strategies as a reliance upon reproducibility, that different people uh, can get the same results from repeated experiments or observations, and an insistence upon descriptive clarity so that the results of an experiment, even if not its interpretation, are expressed in unambiguous ways that all scientists can agree upon and understand. Now, the belief that science qua natural science is the only, or at least the preeminent way to discover true knowledge, is scientism. Its influence has led many disciplines that don't actually lend themselves to the methods of the natural sciences to try in vain to turn themselves into science. But science has specific methods by which it gains its knowledge, and those methods limit its applicability. And there are other ways to gain knowledge that don't possess 
the characteristics on which science insists. So when in 1935 Bertrand Russell wrote as follows, quote, whatever knowledge is attainable must be obtained by scientific methods and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know, which was from his book, Science and Religion, that explicit declaration of scientism was a ghastly mistake. Usually, though, scientism is not explicit like that. It's implicit, especially um, in the writings of many popular anti-theists of this century. For example, Richard Dawkins writes in his book, The God Delusion, did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? Did he himself come alive again three days after being crucified? There is an answer to every such question, whether or not we can discover it in practice, and it is strictly a scientific answer. The methods we should use to settle the matter would be purely and entirely scientific methods, end quote. That scientific assertion ignores the actual ways that history, um, history and historical events are studied. Human history really isn't like natural science, and if you maintain that it is, as Dawkins is maintaining, you end up discounting history's knowledge. Historical evidence is pro predominantly documentary, personal, maybe eyewitness testimony, perhaps uh, some archaeological evidence, all gathered together, taking advantage of our general understanding of what makes people tick, of the attitudes and thinking and the background society of the time in which the events occurred. One reason why scientism is so important in the present discussion is that the critics of belief in God are fond of saying that religion is irrational because there's no evidence for God. They really mean that there's no scientific evidence. There's plenty of historical evidence for the claims of Christianity. I'll agree that history and the truth of Christianity can't be established by the methods of natural science. But my position is that science is plainly not the only route to knowledge. If you artificially elevate science um, in, a, in, in making, making it into a kind of monopoly of knowledge, then you undermine religion, but you also undermine lots of other non-scientific disciplines like history or philosophy and literature and the law and architecture and music and so on. Okay, but is there perhaps, um, even though the scientism I have just repudiated I think is clearly false, is, there not, is that perhaps just a straw man? Is there perhaps an empirical approach to knowledge that applies across all valid disciplines, uh, but which some, like religion maybe, do not follow? Well, I agree that a great deal of what we actually know comes from our experience. But there's also lots of valid knowledge that is not empirical. Mathematics, logic, language, history, moral sense, arguably almost anything you learnt from a book. And even when our knowledge is based on experience, it very often like, lacks the kinds of warrant um, and definiteness that science gains from its insistence upon reproducibility and clarity. It's just not true that the methods of the natural sciences or extensions or generalizations of those empirical methods are the royal route to knowledge. Now, the anti-theists of this century usually put empiricist arguments more simply. They say something like that you can either base your beliefs on evidence or you can base them on faith in some authority. And of course, their view is naturally enough that their secular opinions are rational and based on evidence, while religious people are just, well, irrational faith heads. Um, I reject that simplistic difference, um, that dichotomy of evidence versus, versus faith. I will stipulate that religious beliefs of many people 
are founded on an adoption of what they are taught by their religious authority. That's true. And yet, it's just as true that their scientific beliefs are an adoption of the teachings of their scientific authorities. So should they then, therefore, reject both religion and science? No. This supposed dichotomy between evidence and authority is in practice false. The motto of the Royal Society is nullius in verba, which means on nobody's word. This is the Royal Society of London I'm talking about. According to their website, the motto expresses, quote, the determination of the fellows to withstand the domination of authority and to verify all statements by an appeal to facts determined by experiment. Now, nullius in verba is a fine motto for a scientific society in the Royal Society. Of course, it's a preeminent historical uh, scientific society. But it makes no sense as a general rule for the whole of life. It's simply impossible to verify all statements by an appeal to facts determined by experiment. And to say that one will do so is hopeless scientism. So history, as an example, is not science, mostly because it deals with unique and unrepeatable events of the past, which do not display the reproducibility on which science depends. But there are other very important things in the world and in our lives that defy scientific investigation because they lack the unambiguous clarity, which is the other main characteristic of science. I'm thinking of such matters as the beauty of a sunset or whether a legal verdict is just or whether I love my wife. There's no scientific way to prove Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. There's no scientific way to, ju to judge the justice of a verdict. There isn't even a scientific way to detect a true thought. And yet, these sorts of things are real cognitive questions about, whose, about which the answers are important, and in many cases, the answers are indisputable. Questions about God, I think, are of mostly the same type. They're not scientific. So the most important antidote, I think, to scientism is to give due weight to descriptions from different perspectives, or one might say descriptions at different levels. And this is actually commonplace in science, in the natural sciences, but it needs to be um, advocated at all the levels of description that go beyond. So an illustration might be the human person. You might say that I am an assembly of electrons and quarks. Yes, it's true. I'm a mixture of a wide variety of chemical elements. True. Um, yes, I'm a wonderful system of biochemical processes guided by genetic codes. Yes. Um, I'm a vast and astoundingly complex organization of cooperating cells. Yes. I'm a mammal with hair, a little bit left, um, and warm blood. Yes, I am a person, a husband, a lover, a father. Yes, I am an eternal spirit beloved by God. I am a sinner saved by grace. Not one of those descriptions, I maintain, is necessarily less true than any other. Not one of them rules out the others once we set scientism aside. I don't mean to say that they are in, in, obviously true. I just say, say they don't rule out each other. So here's what I say in closing. Here's what I say about my Christian faith, what it is, and why it is reasonable. It's based upon an assessment of many different types of reasons. Most of them are not scientific, but they are nevertheless logical and rational. The most important types of, re of reasons for me are actually uh, a combination of historical evidence and personal religious experience. And I see my Christian faith as compatible with science, but not compatible with scientism, because basically, scientism is a, is a rival religion. My faith is based in part on experience but not on the certainty of reproducible scientific experiment. Still, that's not a reason to discount it, because like everyone else, um, I make small and large decisions on minimal evidence beyond personal 
preference and maybe impulse um, every moment of my waking life. Uh, if history is any judge, it is people who act boldly with determination and commitment, even in the face of risk and in the absence of complete information, who are successful in this world. And such people are called men and women of action. They act in accordance with a view of the world that is plausible and supported by evidence, but not proven. That is, they act on faith. And I think my religious faith is quite simply the same principle applied to matters of God and the Spirit. Thank you for listening. I want to thank you. But I'm also in a state of confusion. I'm not really sure, other than the fact that once I was in Templeton, why I'm here. And so I have passed out a handout. I'll be going through the handout fairly, and I'll go as quickly as I can. I'm obviously not going to read it all. But I'm here clearly as a woman, and I think it's important to have a female voice. There are many more women in the room than there were 20 some odd years ago. I was one of the very few women in that room when I first joined Templeton. I was at Templeton conferences in Oxford, England. There were three women out of a sea of 400 men. And so it's really wonderful to be here as a woman seeing how the landscape has changed. I'm here as a medievalist. My area of expertise is medieval philosophy very much uh, far removed from Dr. Hutchinson's field, but I have a certain historical perspective that I want to share. I'm here as a Jew, and I think that's important because the whole religion science issue takes on a completely different flavor within Judaism than it does within Christianity. And one thing I have noticed over the past 20 some odd years is that Templeton Veritas religion science debates or conversations should really be reframed as Christianity science debates. And so I want to introduce just a few different notes to the conversation. And then finally, I'm here as a philosopher. I don't know if my department chair is here or not this evening, but if he is, I hope I don't embarrass him. I think there are issues of epistemology and ontology that need to be discussed when we're talking about theories of knowledge and evidence. And so first, I want to define terms, and I'm simply reiterating what we just heard from Dr. Uh, Hutchinson. I read his book very carefully. He didn't deviate from the text, so I'm safe here. You can correct me. You never defined religion, but I want to suggest that religion concerns the supernatural world, incorporates divine revelation, Evidence based on, and I'm quoting you, Dr. Hutchinson, testimony, narrative, human nature, personal experience, and so on. Science associated with the natural world based on reproducibility and clarity of reasoning. Again, Hutchinson, IH stands for Hutchinson. Scientism, we just heard the view that all knowledge is scientific. Hutchinson is committed to rejecting scientism and wants to suggest fruitful dialogue between science and religion. Um, I'm not clear how far that dialogue extends, and maybe that's part of what we can talk about during the Q&A. But an important caveat. In the religion science debates, most studies have focused on science and Christianity. Are there disanalogies between science and religion in different traditions? For example, Buddhism doesn't even recognize a personal deity. The Dalai Lama has written extensively on the compatibility of Buddhism and science, and so they're not part of this conversation. Judaism has always emphasized what I call the hermeneutic interpretation of scripture as reflected in the Talmud, the rabbis, there's also a Kabbalistic influence, Jewish mysticism, and so the whole religion science takes on a completely different tenor in Judaism. Are they in tension with one another? I think if we look at some of the titles, I'm not going to read the next paragraph, but you can read the titles on your own. I actually had some of these people out for the Templeton Conference 20 years ago. 
lots and lots of books all have in common the desire to harmonize accounts of creation from two webs of belief, a web of religious belief and a web of scientific belief. And so clearly there are issues of contention. I think at one point in his, uh, I'm, I'm really pushing your book tonight. In his book, um, Hutchinson says that 97% uh, of the issues in science and religion are non-controversial, but it's those pressure points that become so important, issues of creation, the problem of evil, evolution, etc. And so we can think about the relationship as one of war or as one of peace. And we can turn to the Draper White. I think both, both he and I mentioned that in the in the pieces we sent out to you, Draper and White in the 19th century argued that the relationship between Christianity and science was one of warfare, portraying the history of scientific development as a war against a narrow-minded establishment Christianity. Think of the Galileo affair, right? That's a classic affair. The peace model. Uh, Think of, and I've got a quotation at the bottom of the page there by Francis Bacon, the two books model, writing in the 1600s that God has provided us with two books to understand reality. And we can look at the book of the Bible scripture and we can look at natural science and the two really are different ways of thinking about God's work in the world. We can speak more specifically and, and I know Ian Barber's book came out many years ago. By the way, at the very end of my handout, I have a, a list of some additional readings, some of the individuals that I'm mentioning here. But Barber suggested four ways of thinking about the relation between religion and science. I actually think of it more as three ways because I've never understood the difference between dialogue and integration. So I, I combine those two on my handout. But the conflict mode is that there are serious conflicts between contemporary natural science and classical religious beliefs, and so one must choose between them. Draper White thesis, I think, reflects the conflict model. Independence mode, that the two enterprises are totally independent and autonomous, each with its own distinctive domain and method that religious faith is based on revelation, science is based on human observation, and that these spheres must be kept totally separate. Probably the most famous individual in the 20th century is Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote his work, Rocks of Ages. And in that work, he talks about non-overlapping magisteria, basically the scientific domain, the religious domain, never the twain shall meet. I remember when Early McMullen was here at Templeton uh, for our Templeton conference, he basically summed it up as a sort of um, mental schizophrenia. You park your brain outside the church door and you walk in, you do your devotions, you come back, plug your brain back in and continue with your ordinary life. And so that's the independence mode. The problem with independence mode, and I think this is something we, we, we may want to come back to, is that religious texts do make empirical claims. For example, that God created the world, that Jesus was resurrected. When Dennis Lammerer was here, he noted that in, in, I think it's Matthew, the mustard seed is the smallest seed. Yeah, Matthew. What do we do with the veracity of such statements? If you t follow Gould, they're devoid of truth functionality, and that's problematic. It's problematic for me, and I think it's also problematic for you. So I, I think Gould can only lead us so far. Dialogue and integration, that the boundaries between religion and science are not so clear cut, that the two disciplines share certain presuppositions, summarized again by Ernie McMullen. I love Ernie, he's just a wonderful human being if any of you uh, have had a chance to hear him. The Christian cannot separate his science from his theology as though they were in principle incapable of interrelation. He or she has to aim at some sort of coherence of worldview. 
Now, Barber's writing in the 20th century, but I simply want to put my medieval hat on for a moment and remind you that these are issues that go all the way back to the beginning of the millennium when uh, Judaism and Christianity and Greek philosophy are all interacting with one another. We can look at St. Augustine writing in 354 to 430 AD or CE. Uh, faith is not contrary, but rather complementary to reason. If both complain, uh, proclaim the same truth, then faith cannot contradict reason. We can look at Ibn Rushd, I'm trying to be ecumenical here, a uh, probably the most important medieval Islamic philosopher, Averroes, writing in, 11, in the mid 1100s, demonstrative truth and scriptural truth cannot conflict. We, the Muslim community, know that demonstrative study does not lead to conclusions conflicting with what scripture has given us, for truth does not oppose truth. Maimonides, the greatest medieval philosopher, Jewish philosopher, by the way, I have another book on Maimonides. It's also languishing at the bottom there. Go and buy it. It's a great book. <laughs> Is an interesting case, um, what he wants to claim He's, he's a legal authority and a philosopher that the best way to come to knowledge of God is through science. He's explicit. Galileo, we all know Galileo, but I thought I would give you the actual quotation from his letter to Queen Christina. The purpose of religion is to tell us how to get to heaven, not how the heavens go. And so two very you know, different ways of thinking about the religion science. And I have also got um, Karl Barth and Stephen Jay Gould here. Okay, I want to finish up because I'm sure I'm at the tail end of my allotted time with some historical and epistemological questions you might want to think about during your dinner. If we reject the conflict model in favor of independence, dialogue, or integration, then can we claim that religion plays a role at all in the rise of Western science? Did it function as a hindrance or as a stimulus to the rise of Western science? And I have here two things in mind that we may want to come back to. The condemnations of 1277, some of you may know, Bishop uh, Etienne Tempier in Paris condemned the teaching of Aristotelian natural science in 1277 uh, because it threatened church dogma. And as I remind my students, that was the last of about a dozen condemnations starting in the early 1200s. It reminds me of Boston and the pot laws in the 70s. The uh, Boston elders kept on passing these laws that you can't smoke pot in the Boston Commons. So what does that tell you? A lot of people are smoking pot if they have to pass so many edicts. So here too, people are reading Aristotle. Okay, B, what relation, if any, is there between absolute truth and certainty? It's one thing to believe that truth is an absolute, but another to suppose that we can be certain that we have the truth. It is logically possible to deny certainty, that's an epistemological claim, and yet uphold an absolute theory of truth, that's an ontological claim. We may have beliefs that we take to be true, and these may come to be altered. But that does not mean that truth itself is altered. For example, did Galileo drop iron balls from the leaning tower of Pisa? Either he did or he did not. The truth of the proposition is not mutable, although our opinions or beliefs may have changed. It was once thought that he did. Now we actually believe that he didn't. And C, if we are intellectually honest, in recognizing that other religions should be included in the conversation of science and religion. And I think that is probably my platform, that other religious traditions must be included. Otherwise, it's simply a one-sided discussion of Christianity and science. How are we to adjudicate amongst the various claims? What evidential criteria can we bring to bear on conflicting beliefs? Are some beliefs Belief in God, Jesus, or Mohammed more credible than others. Belief in election fraud, vaccine denial, QAnon, how do we distinguish between them? And if some beliefs we think are more credible than others, what should our reaction be to those who hold patently false beliefs? How far should civil discourse or religious toleration extend? 
And then finally, in case you don't have enough to think about, how does the relation between science and religion impact our lives as we live it? What are the social, ethical implications for deriving from the perspective we personally take with respect to those issues? So I feel that my job has been a conversationalist, throwing out questions, and I'm hoping they stimulate you to further discussion. Well, now it's your turn to talk. And um, around the tables, there are table hosts. We call them facilitators, just to keep the discussion going. So at your table, there will be a host. And if not, just point to somebody and make them the host, because um, you're, you're experienced in this. And also in the center of the table are some questions. I think there are five questions that are sort of launch questions that uh, your facilitator may refer to and say, let's take a look at the launch questions at this point, and so on. So for the next 45 minutes, uh, and dessert will be served also as we continue to eat, but uh, for the next 45 minutes, we'll be here discussing these topics. And then think of your question at the very end. Your table will come up with one question that we can write out on a card and bring up front. OK, thank you. Ian is going to start us off with a question from table two. Table two, here we go. Table two asks, although natural science can't prove God, can natural science give evidence for a creator? I think that in, there are, maybe evidence isn't quite the right word. This is table two here, isn't it? Um, I, I think evidence is, isn't quite the right word. I think that there are um, aspects of, of creation that we study in science, in natural science, that give us pause, give us suggestions, give us indications that um, the world is wonderfully made and that suggests that it might be indeed the creation of an intelligence. That's one approach. Uh, after all, Christians believe, you know, that there is intelligent design, little i, little d. I don't mean capital I, capital D, which is a se separate thing, um, in the sense that God the creator has intelligence and, and has made a world that we understand. And the sorts of evidence, if you like, that, that, um, that are appealing to me are uh, things like, it, isn't it amazing that mathematics is able to explain so much about the world and, and is a way by which we humans are able to understand um, the world. And so the unreasonable um, you know, efficiency of, of, of our ability to understand the world has been remarked on by people who are not Christians. They're, just, they're people who, in many cases, are you know, people who don't actually th think in terms of a personal creator. So that's an example. Um, you know, it's also the case that um, uh, you know, we we now know that the universe had a beginning in some sense, um, and that, um, that some aspects of the stories and, uh, um, and, and teachings about creation that are part of the Christian and Jewish tradition um, seem to accord with science. So all of these are hints, they're, they're suggestions, they're indications. Uh, I don't think they're proofs, but perhaps they're evidence. That's my answer. Would you like to have a go at that? Sure, sure. So I should. You don't have to stand. Oh, no, I'm much better standing. I'm better standing, too. Yeah, yeah, these chairs are awful. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, let me just take, for the sake of it, because it's a conversation, I'll take the opposite point of view. And I will take issue with the existence of design and an intelligent designer. And I would suggest that the problem of evil, the problem of theodicy is maybe the most compelling obstacle to what Ian has laid out. If there were a God, and God were omniscient, and God were omnipotent, and God were benevolent, you know how the story goes, why would God have created such a F-U-C-K-E-D up reality? As I tell my students, 
If God were a woman, she would never have created this state of affairs. She would have created a much more perfect state of affairs. <laughs> and so that really, I think, undercuts the, the argument from intelligent design, intelligent designer, and of course, the we know for sure that the universe had a beginning. We actually don't know that, but we think we know that. And so even if it did have a beginning, it doesn't necessarily prove the existence of an existing deity. It may be that there was once a deity, a deism, that created this world and then went off and created many other worlds. And so I think we can really cut the question both ways. We should move on, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, okay so sh is it my turn? I think so, yeah. You have your own mic, so you can... Oh, okay, so, oh sure. okay, yes, in this co post-COVID reality, we should not be sharing mics. Okay, many of us are, edu this is table four. Where is table four? Okay, many of us are educators. Yes, we're all educators. How can we bring conversations of religion and science into the classroom? I love that question because um, the first Templeton grant I ever got was to put together a course in science and religion, which I did. It was the first course taught at Ohio State in science and religion. My colleagues have now taken that course over. It was a wonderful course being a medievalist. I started with the late antique and then moving into the medieval tradition, making the case that religion and science is nothing new. It's been discussed ever since the fourth century and working through various centuries. And so I, I think it's actually very easy to incorporate religion and science into the classroom. Uh, the other thing I might say is that I've taught courses. I'm, t I'm doing a course on theories of time in philosophy in the spring, and my students don't know it yet, but it's going to be all about religion and science. And so even if you're not teaching a course entitled religion and science, you can sneak it in in any number of other dimensions. That's cheating. <laughs> um, uh, well, it's not quite cheating. I mean, of course, you're in a field where it's very natural to be talking about these conversations in the classroom. And I do share the impulse that's being expressed by your table. Um, I am not usually te talking about God and science in my classes. I'm teaching students how to solve tensor equations or uh, the dispersion relation of waves in plasmas. This um, doesn't have a very obvious Christian or religious content to it. And um, so I treat this uh, in a way that I think is respectful of the subject that I'm talking about. So I don't generally talk much about God, in fact, hardly at all in my classes. But I do think that most students who take classes from me know that I'm a person of Christian faith. And, I, and I, one of the things that I do is I talk about the people in science as well as the subject of science. And that, I think, is an important way in which we bring the humanity of science into play. And actually, when one does that, one almost inevitably ends up bringing up the, the characters of um, historic science, vast proportion of which were actually serious Christians. Um, and so I think that's an, an interesting way where the whole person can become part of the classroom. Thank you. Oh, that's nice. I, I like that. Uh, if I can just add an addendum, a colleague of mine who's not here tonight Oh, a colleague of mine who's not here tonight teaches a course in uh, elementary biology, Bio 1100, I forget what it's called. And when she reaches Darwin, a number of people walk out and they walk back in when she's done with Darwin. And what she's now taken to doing is bringing me in every year and I, and I give a lecture in, their, in, in her course and try to give the parameters of the religion science. And so even in a class is desiccated, I hope there are no biologists just here. As biology, <laughs> straight biology, you can introduce issues of religion and science. Yeah. Okay, it's back to me, is it? Um, okay, table six, where are you? Uh, when, Britain's, when Britain abolished slavery, was it more due to its religious values 
or its scientific enlightenment, or both? Or what place do religious values have in public policy? Well, um, I'm not really a historian of the 19th century in Britain, and, um, but I, th I think it was, in, it was very clearly religious values, which were the dominant influence in the abolition of the slave trade in, and slavery as a whole. Slavery as a whole had very little impact on Britain. There weren't slaves, there were, there were servants, but, but it wasn't slavery in, in the American style. But Britain was very seriously involved in the slave trade, and eventually that was uh, that was banned by, you know, basically a bunch of Christians who dis came to the conclusion that this was something that needed to be changed. It, it w they had a, a long 20, 30 year battle uh, to get that legislation passed through Parliament, uh, in part because it, it, the impact on the economy of Britain um, from the cancellation of that was going to be serious and was to some extent serious, although not as bad as people thought. So I, th I think science had almost nothing to do with it. Um, you know, enlightenment is a separate question. Um, we're told that the better angels of our nature are, are, arise from uh, the, in, the influence of the enlightenment. Um, I'm not sure that that's quite uh, something that I quite buy into, but I think that's a bigger question that I'm going to leave alone. And I'm not going to answer that question because Ian has a much better Brit-type accent than I. Has <laughs> a much greater credibility. It's true. <laughs> it's true. But I, but I want to move on to table eight. Where's table eight? Okay, it's a question I think about a lot. Does one need to have purpose in order to have meaning, direction, motivation, or do those give one purpose, i.e., which comes first? And I'm assuming what I'm, I'm going to I'm going to understand this in the broader sense of does one need to have purpose in one's life to have meaning, direction, motivation, or do those give one purpose? And I think there are really a lot of ways of, of thinking about this. I'm now teaching the existentialists, as many of you know. Most of the existentialists are straightforward atheists. I'm teaching Camus next week, the myth of Sisyphus, and he starts the myth of Sisyphus with a statement, there is only one important question in philosophy, namely whether life has meaning. All the other questions are bogus. He goes on to say, no one has ever died for the ontological argument. <laughs> and so there's a sense in which Creating a meaning for one's life is maybe the most important, the most difficult, but Camus' argument, and I think it's worth stating this argument here, is that one need not believe in God in order to believe that one's life has meaning. One creates one's own meaning, one's own purpose, and so I would say that the two work hand in hand. To some extent, it's a lot easier if one believes in God because God has already defined the purpose of our life and we simply fulfill that purpose. The existentialists are telling us that by creating our purpose, by creating our meaning, we're literally creating our own existence. Okay, um, yeah. Do you need to have a purpose? Um, thank you for that explanation of existentialism, which I think is very, very much to the point. I don't think existentialism gives a transcendent purpose. I think it avoids transcendence. And there is a sense in which you can have a purpose to, you know, that you make up of, of your own life. You have an ambition to do something, you go ahead and you do it, and that's your, that's your purpose. But I think <clears throat> the purpose that comes from um, religious or a spiritual um, viewpoint on life is potentially, at least, a transcendent pur purpose. It's not just something that I am made up. It's something that exists independent of what I do, okay? And that that is missing. That is, the, in a certain sense, the heart of the deficit in existentialism relative to uh, traditional viewpoints on the meaning of life. 
Um, and so I don't think that secular purpose replaces um, religious purpose. And certainly for me, uh, it doesn't. So that's my comment on that. Um, I guess it's my turn. Um, here's, here's one, here's some, um, something that sh I should change my accent to, to ask, okay? <laughs> but I can't do that. Table 13, where are you? Okay. Uh, it seems that the political polarization happening in our society has impacted how people discern truth. How might we overcome the limiting effects of this tribalism in a better pursuit of knowledge? So there are, there are two things here. One is tribalism, okay, and the other is truth. Um, it is true that the tribalism of current politics has led people to have, um, let's say, a, <laughs> only a passing um, appreciation of the importance of truth um, in many cases. And, I, and by the way, I think that's true on both sides of the, the political spectrum. Um, I also think that it, um, it's, it's led to a, a situation in which we don't know how to have um, civil discussion. And so my first answer is, how do we overcome this, is that we should have more round tables. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm deadly serious. I, I think even in the academy, we're just bad at having these conversations between people of differing views. And that, that polarization in our society is in part to be laid at the feet of universities. It's us. Okay, because we do set some of the um, tone of modern debate. And when, and when we are unable to have civil and thoughtful and respectful conversations across um, our differences, then how can we expect the rest of society to do that? And so, so I think that's why it's so terrifically important to have events like this. And, and try to try to have these conversations. I, I once did a Veritas forum at, at RPI um, with a, a philosopher. I seem to get lots of philosophers, I guess. It's my own fault. Um, but, but we had this terrific conversation with, with an audience of, I don't know, you know some number of hundreds. Um, at the end, this philosopher, who originally came from Holland, was we were each of us asked, well, what, what have you gained from this, this, this conversation? And I, I said something, I don't remember what it was, but he um, was so moved by what he'd experienced in our conversation. He was an atheist and, and, and I was a Christian. We were talking about religious questions, okay? But he said, it's so important that we have these kinds of conversations. And, and he literally, his voice cracked as he said it. Um, but I do think that it's ter terrifically important. So that's one thing. The other thing is, by the way, is, is get your heads out of your screens. I, I, just, I, just, I just think that the, the, the World Wide Web is such a, a negative influence on our ability to have respectful conversations that it's so important that we should actually have person-to-person -person experiences. Sorry, I'm preaching now. I should stop. I, it's hard to follow a preacher, but uh, <laughs> I, I, will, I will simply say to this question, and there was another question there about believing absolute truth. Yeah, I'll come to mind, but I do want to say that, yes, I actually am old-fashioned in that I do think there is a truth. I think that some things are ontologically true. I think that we often don't know what they are, and we fall into uh, black holes thinking that we do. I think that I mean, when I teach my class on philosophy of religion, I start out by putting on the board, Jesus Christ was resurrected. That statement is either true or false. It has a truth value. 
And how you regard the truth of that statement will say an awful lot about you. And students don't like to hear that because they're all subjectivists. It's all true. We all have, we bring our own perceptions to reality. And I'm, I guess I'm old fashioned in that regard. <laughs> but. <laughs> You are, and so am I, okay? <laughs> we share, we're, we're old together. <laughs> okay, but I want to turn to table five. Table five, ah, right here, okay. Do you have hope, do, okay, I'm not sure where the emphasis is. Do you have hope for eternal life, and if so, what is it and why? Or do you have hope for eternal life? And if so, what is it and why? And it's ironic because we were both sitting and talking about that very issue at the table. I think one of the, uh, I've learned more in the past week preparing, prepping for this event tonight. I must say, I bought Ian's book, I read it, I went online, I listened to the YouTubes, I have now read more accounts of Jesus' resurrection, did he or didn't he? I know all the arguments, pro and con, and, 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 to, and unfortunately they're not coming up, so I can't show my every edition. <laughs> but we did, talk, we did talk about the afterlife, and I asked Ian, what? Do Christians believe? Am I really going to hell because I haven't accepted Christ? What am I missing out on? And so, what do I think about eternal life? I do think that there is, if you will, an afterlife, but it's not at all of the type that I'm suspecting my colleague envisions. I'm very much in the camp of Spinoza and Einstein and others, I'm, I think I'm more of a panentheist. I think that all matter has been created and when we die, we are simply, our bits of matter are we reconstituted as it were and our, what we are as persons does not continue. There is no personal immortality, and so to speak of eternal life of the individual person uh, is, is, is totally, I can't even begin to wrap my head around it. That's why I was grilling him. What's it like? Do I bring my body with me? Do I bring my memories with me? Do I have a memory book? What's it looking like? I just, I just can't even begin to understand that. I've read too much of Spinoza's ethics. And by the way, he was a Jew, but excommunicated by the Jewish community in Portugal for his heretical views. He's called either a God-intoxicated man or the first atheist, depending on how you look at him. Um, I guess these questions are aimed at both of us, so probably I need to have a go at this too. We did have this very interesting conversation and. Uh, I mean, I think the most, the clearest thing that I said um, about the, de the details is we don't know the details. But I do think that uh, Christians have very naturally um, a view that yes, um, there is a resurrection. Um, and the reason we have it is because we believe Jesus was resurrected. And, and Paul says it very clearly you know, that uh, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus isn't, res isn't raised and our faith is in vain. And so I do think it's a very fundamental part of my own Christian belief uh, that um, there is a resurrection. And, and it's also, you know, if, you're, if you go deeper in the theology, it's actually not a resurrection just of the soul. It's actually a res resurrection of the body. So I believe that I will have a body, um, a heavenly body, uh, I hope it won't, I, I said this earlier, I hope it won't be an old body like this, okay? Um, but, and, but what it'll be like is something completely, um, I, I would say, not addressed by the Christian faith or by the, by the Bible. And um, so I do have that hope. Um, and the main reason why is because I believe Jesus was raised from the dead and as the first fruits of, uh, of that resurrection. So that's my... Quick answer. Can I just go for it? I just, and again, this is my ignorance. Just because Jesus may or may not have been resurrected does not imply that you will be necessarily resurrected. It may be that Jesus was the one and only individual to ever be resurrected, and you're stuck in the same place I am. <laughs> you, you might think that, but Jesus taught his followers very 
something very different. He said, where, where, where I go, you will go, okay? Um, and so he taught his followers that he was heading for a death and a resurrection, and um, they were surprised by it because they didn't really believe in it, but because they saw it for themselves, uh, it changed their whole outlook, I, I would say. And, um, and so I think there is a reason to believe that there is a connection between Jesus' resurrection and our resurrection for Christians, and that's one of the reasons. Of course, Paul's argument is, in a certain sense, a bit of a negative argument because he was, he was addressing the, the people who's, who doubted that there was going to be um, a resurrection and were beginning to say there isn't going to be a resurrection. And his argument was if there isn't a resurrection, Christ is not raised. So he's, again, drawing the connection, but perhaps in a negative way, right. and not, in, not in, a, in a logically uh, definitive way. Yeah, he would have gotten a C in a logic class. <laughs> I don't think that's fair. <laughs> Should we uh, yes. call it? So we haven't, uh, we haven't answered all of your questions, and we're going to continue this downstairs, but the witching hour is 9 o'clock, 9.05, and uh, so we're going to stand up, take a break, use the restrooms. If you would like to join the conversation with uh, Tamar and Ian downstairs where we started, uh, you're more than welcome to go down there with us. So thank you for coming. I want to thank our sponsors, the Templeton Foundation, uh, the Veritas Forum, who's uh, provided the video. This will, be, this will be available for you to see if you're interested or pass on to other colleagues in the future. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. We'll look forward to next year when we do another one. Okay. <laughs>